So, again, lecture one, my whole theme during lecture one was just to explain to folks that there is a context and there's a continuity of struggle. And I kept stating over and over again that if you ignore the context and you ignore the continuity of struggle, then your best efforts, no matter how great they may be, are going to be doomed to result in failure. So this entire lecture, this entire lecture series has been how do we work to develop or frame that context so that we can uh, conduct analysis that really help us to, to come up with better solutions, right? Because all the solutions that we see happening so far are solutions that deal with symptoms but we never get at the root cause and when we're dealing with symptoms then we focus on the victim right we, we focus on the person being aggressed upon and not the aggressor because the symptoms are manifested and the person being aggressed upon right but if we want to get to the root cause we have to make our analysis of the aggressor right that's why when you look at you know afrocentricity international you look at our <clears throat> you look at our uh constitution it states very clearly that we have a responsibility to analyze uh, domination and to critique domination. I no longer refer to it as white supremacy. I refer to it as white minority rule because that's what it is. It's a minority of the planet exercising their will over a majority of the planet. So they're not supreme, right? If they're supreme in your mind, we got to figure out how to exercise that demon so that they're no longer supreme in your mind. But it's not white supremacy. It's white minority rule. All right, so, so when we look at the Cold War era of American uh, diplomacy, that's going to be our focus of today. Um, the Cold War is affectionately known as the war for the hearts and minds, right? Because it's not a war where they are, you know, um, you know, going in using direct militia, at least at this point in the history, where they're going in and using their military might to control these nations that were recently, you know, up obtained their independence, right? So the tools during this period are public relations, media, and entertainment, right? All right, so, so I said we're going to be hearing a lot tonight from uh, Nana Malcolm X. So I want to start um, by just reading an exchange where Malcolm, Nana Malcolm is always attempting to contextualize our situation for these integrationists who really just don't understand it, right? So this is a um, debate. Um, it was an open mind roundtable that was held on June 12th, uh, 1963. It was between J uh, James Former, Wyatt T. Walker, who was um, um, Dr. King's second in command, uh, Alan Morrison, and Nana Malcolm X, right? So they were debating. If you haven't watched this debate, you can go online on YouTube and find it. Um, but this is an exchange that happened between uh, Nana Malcolm and James Former, right? So uh, Nana Malcolm says, the only time that the black man in this country has made any progress was in wartime. When the white man has his back to the wall, then he lets the black man come forward a little, a little bit. And as soon as the war is over, he tells the black man, get back off me now. So James Former replies, he says, you say that progress is only achieved in wartime. We're in the war now. The war is being waged in the streets of Birmingham, the streets of Greenboro, the streets of Danville, Virginia. Malcolm X, that's not the war. James Former, now wait a minute. This is the war. Malcolm X, that's not the war. That's the result of the war. America is at war with Russia. Right? So he's, he's telling him that what you're arguing is, the, is the, the conflict, this whole civil rights struggle. He's saying, no, that's not the true conflict. What's happening, he, he's saying um, the America, right, the Western Bloc, is engaged in the struggle with the Eastern Bloc. He's, he's trying to tell him, like, that's the war. What you're looking at is a symptom of the war, right? All this so-called progress you are making is only being made within that context. And if you don't understand it, then you're already lost. So this is where he's trying to elevate their thinking to or, or heighten their consciousness. Um, I have to read this here. This comes from uh, Malcolm's, uh, Nana Malcolm X's final speech that he gave. Um, and it, this is so important because it's, he's showing here that his next effort and analysis where he was going to truly try to explain to black people how the Cold War struggle impacted our struggle and what we needed to do next. But unfortunately, he never really got a chance to fully develop and unpack that an analysis, right? So, you know, as someone who, who considers himself to be in that tradition, I'm attempting here to unpack that analysis that Malcolm was trying, that Nana Malcolm was trying to start. So that's why I say to you today that this is all I'm going to focus on today is this one part, right? The con the 
African world struggle in the context of the Cold War because it's so much material that like if I tried to do it quickly, I would lose people. Right, so I, I have to read this for a moment. He says, after 1959, the spirit of African nationalism was fanned to a high flame, and we then began to witness the complete collapse of colonialism. France began to get out of French West Africa, Belgium began to make moves to get out of the Congo, Britain began to make moves to get out of Kenya, Tanganyika, Uganda, Nigeria, and some of these other places, and although it looked like they were getting out, they pulled a trick that was colossal. He says, and that when you're playing basketball and you get trapped, you don't throw the ball away. You throw it to one of your teammates who's in the clear. And that is what the European powers did. They were trapped on the African continent. They couldn't stay there. They were looked upon as colonial imperialists. So they had to pass the ball to someone whose image was different. And they passed the ball to Uncle Sam. And he picked it up and has been running with it for a touchdown ever since. He was in the clear. He was not looked upon as one who had colonized the African continent. But at that time, the Africans couldn't see that though the United States hadn't colonized the African continent, he had colonized 22 million blacks here on this continent because we are just as thoroughly colonized as anybody else. When the ball was passed to the United States, it was passed at the time when John Kennedy came to power. He picked it up and helped to run it. He was one of the shrewdest backfield runners that history has ever recorded. He had surrounded himself with intellectuals, highly educated, learned, and well-informed people, and their analysis told him that the government of America was confronted with a new problem. And this new problem stemmed from the fact that Africans were now awakened. They were enlightened and they were fearless. They would fight. So this meant that the Western powers couldn't stay there by force. And since their own economies, the European economy and the American economy, was based upon their continued influence over the African continent, they had to find some means of staying there. So they used the friendly approach. They switched from old, open colonial imperialistic approach to the benevolent approach. They came up with some benevolent colonialism, philanthropic colonialism, humanitarianism, or dollarism. Immediately, everything was Peace Corps, crossroads, we've got to help our African brothers. So realizing that it was necessary to come up with these new approaches, Kennedy did it. He won. He created an image of himself that was skillfully designed to make the people of the African continent think that he was Jesus, the great white father, come to make things right. And he finishes by saying, from 1954 to 1964 was the era in which we witnessed the emergence of Africa. The impact that this had upon the civil rights struggle in America has never been told, fully told, right? So he, he's, he's letting us know that the, the, the analysis of this period, of this what's referred to as the post-war or the Cold War period, and the impact that it had on our, on our struggle here, like, we are completely clueless because we're being misled by people who also don't understand it. And unfortunately, you know, a week later, Malcolm was assassinated, so he never really got a chance to delve into this analysis. So let's take a look at it. Let's start this analysis. During the post-war period or the Cold War period, America had three primary objectives that it was pursuing simultaneously. The first was perception management, the second was regime change, and the third was the disruption of the African liberation movement, especially here on, on, in the uh, United States of America. Right. So I'll start by dealing with uh, perception management. Right. So. We, we dealt with during the first lecture how America was using what's referred to as big stick diplomacy or gunboat diplomacy. It was just basically running up in people's shop, you know, holding them up by their ankles, taking the money out their pockets, installing a ruler, like flexing their muscle. We dealt with all of that, right? So this was the American image. That and the fact that they had colonized 22 million Africans right here in this nation who they had Jim Crowed, who they had tortured, who they had lynched, right? This, all this blood is on America's hands. So America is trying to shape or re reshape its image at a time when the other colonial power is like, you know, the, the, the jig is already up for them. P the African continent and African people don't see them as friendly, right? But America, you know, has, you know, like he said, this friendly approach to colonialism. So I'm going to start here with a quote. Um, this is from Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, she says, anyone who has worked in the international field knows well that our failure in race relations and our open discrimination against various groups injures, injures our leadership in the world. 
It is the one point which can be attacked and which the representatives of the United States have no answer. Meaning, like, she's saying, like, hey, we're, we're hypocrites, and these people can always exploit us. And, in fact, Malcolm did. Not nah, nah, Malcolm did. He went all over the world telling African leaders, like, no, 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 these folks are hypocrites. Look what they're doing right here to, to the African right here in the United States. Don't you believe them? Right? So they say, okay, we got this image problem. We have to fix it. Um, this was uh, 1947. Uh, 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 Roosevelt. Uh, convenes uh, the Committee on Civil Rights. It says, uh, throughout this uh, p uh, Pacific, uh, Latin America, Africa, and the near, middle, and far east, the treatment which our Negroes receive is taken as a reflection of our attitude towards all dark-skinned people. And this plays into the hands of communist propagandists. The United States is not so strong uh, uh, the, the United States is not so strong, the final triumph of democratic ideal is not so inevitable that we can ignore what the world thinks of our record, right? So, it, like, this is, at, this is at the point when it, uh, the United States is noticing, hey, we're emerging as a power, but we're not all powerful yet where we can just say, we don't care what the rest of the world thinks. Like what they recently did when they brought the, 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 the puppet president from Venezuela and they brought him to, um, what is this thing America does? The State of the Union, that's what it is. And they brought, they brought one of their puppet dictators and literally you know, gave him a, a round of applause. Like, so now they're strong and they're brazen, so they can just say, like, this is just what it is. Get down and lay down. But at that point, they couldn't do that. They had to do things a little like, you know, underhanded, sneakily, and in order to accomplish that, you know, you need, you know, people, you know, within the group that you're colonizing to work with you to achieve that, right? You need collaborators, right, in order to, to dominate them. You need traitors, essentially, right? So this is the repair period that I refer to as Mask On. Y'all remember that Future has a song that's like, Mask On. You know, 